we're the sandwich generation, right? Taking care of kids, taking care of mom and dad. And mom and dad's hard work, we'd like to protect some of that, maybe pass it on to our kids, right? Aaron Miller, attorney Aaron Miller, is an expert in elder law. You know that sliver of legal expertise that probably all of us at some point may, may need to call to protect mom and dad, because maybe mom and dad, you know, they need assisted living, like 24-hour care. They're really, really sick, and they're very weak. But at the same time, you'd like to protect their hard work and family assets and pass it on to your kids, you know. I'm talking about Medicaid, people. I'm talking about, like, the, the last resort, the, that last net of protection that will provide mom and dad. If they do not have those policies, you know, those uh, uh, continuous care, uh, assisted, le- uh, assisted living nursing care uh, insurance policies, yeah, it's Medicaid. It's going to need to pay all that. Have the insurance or the assets to pay for the rest of their life to pay for this type of care. But at the same time, maybe you're trying to figure out a way to protect Maybe their homestead, just like one house and a little bit of assets, and keep that and provide it for your children. Is it true that once an an elderly uh, loved one goes into nursing care, and there, you know, whatever assets are consumed to pay for that, and then they get into a Social Security check situation, and that helps pay in part the the nursing care, and Medicaid pays for all oh. the other medicines, everything else. It, is it true that? The home, the homestead, whatever home that uh, elderly individual was in, that will be claimed by the state uh, once the uh, the loved one passes. Yeah, so uh, a house is actually not a countable asset here in Texas uh, when they apply for Medicaid uh, and when they go into a nursing home. But if they haven't done anything to protect that house, yes, absolutely. It could be through Medicaid and state recovery after they pass away, Medicaid can try to go after the house. And so typically what we do is uh, we do something called a, a ladybird deed or a transfer on death deed, which in Texas avoids the probate process and actually also avoids Medicaid and state recovery. And it's never too late to do that as long as mom and dad are still, or, or you know, the applicant is still alive and still understands what's going on, or if there's a power of attorney in place, so we can okay. do it for them as well. Yeah, but what if the parent is already in nursing care? And the homestead oh, is just sitting there. It, it's still not too oh, late to, okay. I apologize. Yeah. So even if they're in a nursing home, as long as they're still competent and they could sign the deed, or if we have a power of attorney, um, we could have the agent under the power of attorney sign the deed. Or if we have to, we can go get a guardianship. So even if they're actually in a nursing home, it's not too late to get that in place. Uh, under all situations or just in a situation where, let's say, a, another family member is living in the home or can the home be vacant empty and and still be able to segue in this program that you mentioned yeah as long as the the as long as the house is still considered that the applicant's homestead they haven't given it away uh, they haven't um it's still uh, it's still not a countable asset for medicaid and then also we can uh, uh Put this lady deed in place for training for death deed and void medicaid and state recovery so it's one of the few instances in law where you could actually have your cake and eat it too aaron miller is an expert in elder law joins us from north texas you mentioned uh the five-year rule why five years like uh, you want to plan plan five years out why five years and why did you say that number well five years is the the rule that the government has put in place where uh, if you've given assets away in the last five years where you apply for nursing home Medicaid, then they will impose a penalty, a, a time penalty. In other words, you would be otherwise qualified for Medicaid and getting government benefits, but because you gave away assets within that five-year window, they're going to say, well, we're not going to pay for a certain period of time. And that period of time uh, it depends on the value of the asset that you gave away and uh, what they, and they divide it by what they call the average nursing home cost per day in Texas. And that gives you a period of time where you would not otherwise be, they're not going to pay. Who pays the nursing home bill? I know a portion of it might be that Social Security check, but sometimes that Social Security check when a loved one does not have any assets left, that that's not enough. So who pays the full bill that sometimes it would be five, seven, maybe $10,000 a month? Yeah, it can be scary. But a lot of people, a lot of my clients are really surprised when they see what the cost of nursing home is. And that's typically when they come and see me. So if if you don't have enough money to pay the nursing home bill, either through your income or through assets, 
then either the family is going to have to pay some money or we're going to have to look at getting qualified for government benefits. Typically, that's going to be Medicaid and help, and that's going to help pay for the yeah. nursing home costs. Okay. Okay. In that scenario, Medicaid does pay for the remainder, the portion of of the nursing home costs. But let's say it's a, just round it out, right? Two thousand um, dollar social security check, right? Uh, that's applied, and then the rest is paid by Medicaid for that resident to stay in, let's say, Alzheimer's care at a nursing home, something like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what they do is they look at the the gross income of the the applicant. They uh, allow the applicant to keep what's called a personal needs allowance, sixty dollars a month. Um, they let the applicant keep paying their Medicare Part B and all their uh, health insurance. And then if they're single, whatever's left over goes to the nursing home to help pay for care. We call that a copay. And then Medicaid will pick up the rest. Now, if they're married, then it gets a little bit more complicated because we're going to look at the uh, assets of the well spouse, not to take away any assets, but to see if we can give any, any I'm sorry, not assets, income, if, to see if we can give any of the six spouses income to the well spouse to get them up to about $3,000 a month in income. Yeah. But um, if, the, if the person's just a single individual, then um, we'll do that calculation. We'll pay, part, pay most of that income to the nursing home. Elder law care, uh, elder law expert, Aaron Miller is my guest. You mentioned earlier gifts, like if if the elderly uh, loved one gifts assets. Describe that. What are you talking about? Like gold coins, uh, machinery, um, yeah. uh, a, a little baby, like little beanie baby uh, tie beanie baby collection that's in the thousands of dollars. I mean, what what are you talking about? Yeah, so it can really be anything. And and what Medicaid does is they assume that you gave it away to get qualified for Medicaid. And there's ways to, to rebut that. Within that five-year yeah, period it, that you were referring to. Within, within that, okay. Yes, sir, within I that five-year window that uh, we were talking about. Yeah, and it could be, you know, you gave money on a bank account or out of your bank account. It could be, you know, maybe you gave them your house or maybe it could be even like services. Let's say that uh, you wanted your grandson to come paint your house and you know, the the value of the paint job was twenty thousand dollars, but you gave them forty thousand dollars because it was your grandson, and you know you wanted to help out a little bit. That extra twenty thousand would be considered a gift. So there's lots of rules about wow. in and out. Who of makes all these assessments? Can... Who has the time to to cherry pick all this bit by bit, line yeah, by line, bank statement by bank statement? Who has all the time for that? Yeah. It's a great question. Yeah. So what we have to do when we put an application together is we we look through all that and we talk about, you know, if there's anything to be given away and we look for uh, major gifts. Now, anything under about $200, they don't necessarily uh, go after that, but we want to, we're looking for the big, the big items. And um, if, if it's something that we know about, we have to disclose it to Medicaid and, so, and they'll go back through if, if they find yeah. uh, some yeah. discrepancies, they'll ask about it. You know what I'm thinking as you're telling me all this, the sooner, the better when it comes to transferring ownership of your assets you want your children to have what you work for when you're strong and young get yourself uh, one of those insurance policies to pay for elder care or nursing care and then give your kids the name you know put their put their name on, on the assets give them the house give them the cars give them the gold give them everything early in life so that way the family keeps it and you got your little insurance to go pay for nursing care in the future that's what I'm thinking as you're telling me all this that would be optimum well, you you want to definitely do planning early. Um, I don't know if you necessarily want to give up control of your house or your stuff. And so that's one of the, the w reasons why um, an irrevocable trust is really great is because you can still uh, put your assets in this, certainly your assets in this trust, and it's a way you can still maintain control. The kids can't run off with it, but uh, – it's not a countable asset if it's been in there for five years uh, for Medicaid purposes. So it's a way to, to kind of to pre-plan. It still contains some, some control. You don't have to get, like give everything and hope the kids uh, do the right thing. Okay. All good points. Uh, we could probably keep talking about this <laughs> all afternoon long, but uh, <laughs> we learned a lot uh, with you. Thank you. And we'll call you back, obviously, since, as I said at the beginning, we're the sandwich generation taking care of kids and also taking care of elderly loved ones. Thank you, Aaron. Pre appreciate your time from North Texas. Elder law expert Aaron Miller.